much uh, for the organizers to organizing this fantastic conference. I want to say from the start, I really enjoyed um, reading Alan's paper. I think it gives a fantastic overview of uh, current uh, modern theories, modern economic understanding of uh, capital taxation and emphasizes that it's very different economics play a role uh, than from labor taxes, and they, those are distinctly two objects. And uh, in the paper, he talks much more about different aspects of, of uh, capital taxation. I, I, I couldn't agree more with, with, with what he says. Uh, so, given that I agree so, so much with, with his paper, so I, th I thought what I'll do in this um, discussion, I'll pick up from where uh, Alan stopped. So in his talk, Alan mainly talks about qualitative predictions of the theory, whether you want to tax something at the same rate or not, whether it should be positive or negative. So here, what I'll try to go to take the next step and talk about the quantitative predictions, how big uh, those effects are. And originally, I was planning to uh, take a few of the uh, stories, a few of the theories that, that um, uh, Alan mentioned and kind of put some numbers on it, and then I reala realized uh, I'll run out of time. So what I'll, I'll do in this discussion, I'll pick one particular aspect of, of taxation, one particular theory that, that Alan mentioned, will, which will be taxation of savings in, uh, in the life cycle models where individuals are subject to idiosyncratic shocks. And there I will focus on, on two quantitative questions. So what are the key parameters which determine the size of taxes, and uh, how much about, what are they, like how much we know about them from the empirical work, what are the kind of numbers, how, how the numbers for the optimal taxes depend on the parameters that we get from, from data. Okay. So through most of my talk, I will focus on, uh, on the following economy. I'll be thinking about uh, an economy where everybody lives for uh, T plus one period, so it will be a life cycle model. Uh, I pick a very particular um, reference parameter, mainly because that pins down, that fixes the key elasticities which will determine um, the optimal uh, capital and labor taxes in, in this economy. With more general preferences, you get the same in size, except there you need to work out what's the implied elasticity are. Here I can control them uh, directly. And the way I'll be thinking about this economy, individuals will be born with some initial skills, so th theta will, will be their skill. Uh, and then in addition to this initial heterogeneity in their productivities, individuals will be also uh, be hit with ongoing idiosyncratic shocks over their lifetime. Um, I'll think about, um, so technically I'll be assuming that, that productivity is a private information so that taxes cannot depend explicitly on that productivity. I'll be thinking for most of the talk on partial equilibrium, so interest rates will be just fixed to the inverse of the discount factor. So in this model, there are two goals of, of, of the optimal tax policy. The first goal is pure redistribution, to redistribute, if we care about some measure of equality, we want to redistribute from individuals who got, got high uh, productivity shock to the individuals who were, were born with low productivity. The second goal of um, of, of, ta of, of tax system will be here to provide insurance against some of the idiosyncratic shocks. And, uh, and those goals will play, um, th th that second goal will play a pretty important role, especially when it will come to capital taxation. So you can think about two benchmarks. There are, there are two benchmarks you can practically solve in this model. One benchmark is to start with a full optimal taxes, what we can uh, possibly achieve given that the friction that there is only uh, private information. Uh, the other benchmark is to start with some particularly easy to solve uh, functional forms like linear taxes and kind of try to solve in the computer what happens there. That roughly corresponds to Merlisian and, um, and Ramsey approaches uh, to taxation. People tend to think that they're very different objects. In this theory, actually, they're, they're not that different. Uh, doing full optimal tax allow you to pin down very precisely kind of the, the key uh, tax rate for, for, for each particular segment of the population. What Ramsey does is effectively just fixes it, says some of the tax rates should be exactly the same for this guy and for that guy. If you want to get a sense, if you know the answer to the first question, if you want to get a sense how Ramsey tax will look like, some weighted average of, of, of the taxes which will come from, from first 
model will give you a pretty good idea what will come out of, of Ramsey benchmark. So for this reason, I'll focus on the first, and mainly a big chunk of my work will be based on, on two papers, one, one which uh, I've wrote with Maxim Troshkin and Alex Savinsky, and the other we work with Emmanuel Fari and Ivan Bruning. So, uncertainty will play a crucial role, especially when we come to savings, because in these models, savings tax should be equal to zero if there is no uncertainty, if, if, all, the, uh, if all the shocks are deterministic. And by savings taxes in this model, I'll, I'll mean all forms of, of taxation of intertemporal uh, reshuffle on the resources, from taxes on wealth, uh, to cor corporate taxes, taxes on, on, um, on interest income. So stochastic process for theta, in principle, we can estimate it uh, from the data. There's general consensus that, that process is quite persistent, so I'll just, I'll just assume this process for now. Um, distribution of shocks which hit individuals will play an important role. Uh, the more macro labor literature, uh, traditional look at the PSID to, to, to pick, uh, figure out what, what the process is. And typically, they, they use a log normal distribution of shocks and with standard deviation of shocks, something like 0 0.1, 0.2. More recently, the social security data became available. That data emphasized that there are much higher moments, skewness and kurtosis of, of shocks will play an important role. So I kind of will, will try to talk about how those models, how, how those moments matter. So here I plotted a representative figure for, I call them taxes, but, but uh, as Alan correctly pointed out, these are wedges, these are distortions in consumption labor choice and your uh, savings accumulation. And there are many different ways in principle uh, you can achieve the same distortion. That, that's true very generally, not only about this model, but. Uh, there is a lot of equivalence in different taxes we use. So, in principle, so these are representative histories. Um, which in print, on the background, there is an, a lot of history dependence. So the key, the key I want you to, so on the left, I, I show you effective labor taxes. And it's, it's a bit poor label, and the dotted lines are kind of the more important ones. And on the right is, is capital tax. So this is, on the left, uh, uh, I picked I generated these figures. I picked elasticity of substitution of 0.5 utilitarian planner uh, a log uh, uh, log utility of consumption. So intertemporal elasticity of substitution is one. So, so the dotted, there are two dotted lines. One is if you just purely take the, the high kurtosis one. That the black dotted line is for uh, for all individuals which come in the social security data. Uh, the low kurtosis one are males between ages 35 and 55, so they have lower, uh, the high high moments uh, are lower. So the general things you get about the optimal labor taxes, they're kind of U-shaped. Um, you have on the general, on the, uh, with the low values around the point where you kind of expect it to be. If, if you are on average expect to be around, making around $60,000 a year, your, your, your labor taxes are, are quite low. If you have unexpectedly high, unexpectedly low taxes, then your labor distortions are pretty high. Um, and the capital taxes, these are, these are savings wages. You can think about them as distortion on your total sa savings, on, on, on gross savings, uh, basically principal and the interest rate. So what drives the, these results? So the high distortions on the uh, and the uh, and the, the solid line is what happens in these models if you have, if you turn off all the high moment shocks and only focus on the um, on log normal distributions. So what drives these numbers? So on the left hand, so, so I'll talk about labor distortions first. On the left hand, you basically have quite generically pretty high labor distortions. Uh, that mainly driven by your redistributor objectives. If you want to give money to the poor, eventually you need to start phasing them, that out. The best time to phase them out is at the times when there are still not that many people who, who are subject to phase outs, because phase outs introduce labor distortions. And also for the people who are not very productive in this model. Because even if their labor supply is high, if they're not very productive, it's not a very big deal uh, in, in the context of the, this model whether they respond a lot or not. So on the left, on the left side, you, you High distortions are mainly driven by, by redistributor objectives. On the right hand side, the distortions are mainly driven by two parameters, which is um, 
elasticity of labor supply and uh, an appropriate hazard ratio of the shocks. If you have something like log normal shocks, you can get simple uh, formula for, for the tail distribution of, of um, labor distortions, which is one plus one over epsilon times sigma squared. As I said, I, I, I plugged my numbers for these particular parameter values. If, if you think they're too high or too low, you can easily scale them up or down using this formula. With higher moments, uh, it's not the, the, the total elasticity of, uh, it, it not, not total variance of your shocks, but, but the appropriate function of higher moments uh, for which we, we, we derive the expressions which, which, which drive your, uh, your marginal tax. So, so higher, higher marginal tax, uh, higher, higher moments generally imply higher, um, uh, higher labor distortions. Now, to turn to savings tax. So t savings tax in this model is driven primarily by how much idiosyncratic uncertainty you face. As I said, no idiosyncratic uncertainty, we don't want to tax, dis distort any of your decisions. And yet, tax on total savings, again, on the gross savings, is kind of proportional to one, is, is equally, exactly equal to one minus um, exponential of sigma squared of, of, of the variance of shocks that, that you face. If you look for, a, if you take standard PSID data and the analysis people use from there, those numbers are pretty small. You, 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 get, uh, you get pretty small number, you get something like 1% of, uh, of tax on your gross income, which translates something like 15% tax on interest rate. If you take social security data, they, their uh, variance comes out sufficiently bigger, uh, so we get the numbers with higher moments which are double or triple of what you get from, from PSID. What is important, these numbers in particular are very sensitive to the general equilibrium effects. And partial equilibrium, they can be high, they can go easily over, over 100%, which will, you can think about it as, as wealth tax or property tax. Uh, but general equilibrium effects can substantially reduce that. So from, um, from, from kind of quantitative uh, Predictions, so, so we, we, we can derive, the theory provides very tight links to from empirically as, estimatable or measurable uh, parameters to, to what rates should be. And, uh, and what it points out that important is things like what, how big is idiosyncratic uncertainty that individuals face, and also how big are the general equilibrium effects are. Uh, other things that I, I'll mention, so here I pick parameter value for elasticity of labor supply 0.5, not because they believe that's a good parameter, but because that's generally what people use in, in, in this literature. Uh, this type of elasticity, they don't take into account responses like educational decisions, occupational choice, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Michael Keane made, made, and uh, Jim Heckman gave a fantastic discussion about labor supply. All, all the uh, concerns apply directly here. Another thing which is important is consumption labor complementarity. How important is that how big complementarity between consumption and labor for individuals, especially for the high, uh, high income individuals. If that, if, that uncertainty, if that complementarity is important, then what we want to do for the high individuals with high labor earnings, we want to reduce their labor taxes and incre increase their capital taxes because they are very productive. Uh, we want to provide them with the maximum incentive to, to, um, uh, uh, to work. So here I, I plotted just, I, I, uh, tax schedules for, for labor and capital vary in the, the complementarity between consumption and labor. So you see like the, 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 the richer the individuals become, their labor income starts to drop for, 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 for if, if there is complementarity and the savings taxes start to go up. Okay, so the model I, um, the model which I gave um, uh, is kind of a standard life cycle economy which is used a lot and used very widely. Uh, it fits a lot of a lot of facts about about behavior of the households. At the same time, this model is off the mark, and off the mark will be a big understatement of uh, of the distribution of wealth and distribution of ha capital holdings that we see in the data. This model will predict that distribution of labor earnings will be much bigger, that will have much bigger tails than than wealth. In the data, we see the opposite. So. The leading story is why we have, we have this very skewed wealth distribution is either that that wealth was inherited or that it was earned by entrepreneurs who have 
particularly high uh, ability to, um, to run businesses and generate uh, production opportunities. So depending on which, which of the stories is true or how much, they, or the, how much of this wealth is transmitted by each, each of these channels, they will have very different normative implications. If you think about inheritance taxation, by, lar by large, the main parameter which tells you how we want to tax inheritance is how much we value utility of the current generations versus utility of the later generations, how much Pareto weights we put on different agents. Uh, people have written different papers with different assumptions of those, those weights. They, they got numbers which are big or small. They, they got um, positive, negative numbers. That ultimately is kind of how the society views whether it's a good idea to, 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 to give these big bequests and then we kind of need to live with this inequality or, or, or it's not a good idea. Then potentially with, savings, with inheritance taxes we can generate a lot of revenues and reduce substantially the inequality. If it's taxation of entrepreneurs, then it's a real entrepreneurs who generate the, this inequality, then, then the, the, the forces, then generally the same forces conceptually drive taxation of entrepreneurs as taxation of labor supply, except now you kind of need to, to adjust for the appropriate measure of the elasticity of, uh, of moral hazard or elasticity of effort supply by entrepreneur. There is some work there. Numbers potential can be big, but there is very little kind of empirical evidence what I think uh, about how exactly these entrepreneurs accumulate wealth, what, what's the moral hazard there. So uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Um, I think, uh, I think it's, it's a fantastic conference, and uh, it gives this real opportunity to bring empirical evidence together with kind of theoretical predictions and, and link, uh, link the two together and get uh, quantitative implications of optimal taxes and kind of discuss how robust those implications are.